guys. So, how's your afternoon going? Feeling, feeling scallied out yet, or like, no, no, you still got some time? Okay, cool. I'm Kelsey. Uh, this here, this is, that's my familiar, Cheryl. Uh, we've got Stu up here who's gonna be joining us via astral projection later on. I'm here to talk, and Stu and Cheryl and I are all here to talk about uh, Scala Check. So I'm curious, like, in the room, are there folks here who are using Scala Check now on projects? Give me a hands up. All right, we got some folks. Um, that's cool. I'm glad y'all are here because you guys can back me up to let the other folks know what Scala Check is. So, what is Scala Check? Skalacek is witchcraft. Um, Skalacek is witchcraft that makes you super powerful. It's a really powerful way to find bugs in your code. Like, really powerful. Like, burn at the stake when your crops fail powerful. It's totally magic. Uh, what is it exactly? Skalacek is a Scala port of a Haskell library called QuickCheck, uh, designed for property-based testing. Property-based testing is it's, it's a little bit like the testing you're used to. So this is like an example-based test, which is what most of us write when we write unit tests. You sort of set up some input, you run some code, and you verify the output. Um, it's an imperative model. You're telling the testing framework what to do and how to verify it. And that's useful, it's important, it's good to do. There's a subtle difference between this model and between property-based testing that's kind of similar to the subtle difference between imperative programming and functional programming. When we program in a more functional model, Instead of like telling the computer what to do and in what order, we tend to try to tell the computer what things are, we define things. And that is a really subtle distinction that gives us a lot of power. And there is a corresponding thing with property-based testing where instead of defining what our code should do in this situation, we say that there are truths about the output of our code given a certain input. And when we define it like that, actually, it turns out that we can do a lot of really cool things. So when we define it like that, we can, with a little bit of magic, automatically generate lots and lots and lots of inputs and let the computer automatically verify those properties we defined for all those outputs. So we sort of like you magnify your code coverage in this huge way and there's all these cool things you can do with it. So this is advanced Scala check. It's gonna be a little bit of like a flyover tour. Like you guys, you guys see enough code at work, right? I mean, come on. Um, I am gonna show you some code, but I wanna kinda give you some ideas of concepts and cool tricks and exciting projects that could kinda pique your imagination. What can I do with property-based testing? And at the end, I'm gonna, my, uh, my buddy Stu is gonna come on in from the ether and show you a little bit of like hands-on code yourself. So what does Scala Check do for you, the library itself? It generates, it runs, and it shrinks. So it generates input. Uh, this input usually is designed to hit edge cases more frequently, which makes sense, right? Like when you're hand generating input for tests, you wanna make sure that you've got those edge cases right. But it can cover all kinds of input. It takes a bunch of these inputs and it verifies properties that you define against your code on it. If it finds failures, and this is a pretty cool feature, it tries to shrink the failure space to the smallest possible set it can figure out. So if it turns out that, say, you know, non-unicode characters break your code, it's gonna try to show you just one, rather than show you a whole list of things that it failed on. And that's a really, really powerful thing to have for you. It's like you're getting like a, a whole lap head start on debugging, which is cool. So like, this is what it looks like. This is a whole file. This is a complete Scala check file. You could run this as is, um, assuming that you had a project with a dependency on Scala check without any extra imports. There's nothing to find outside the file. Basically, I've written this silly little spell method, and I've defined a property about it, right? It's pretty reasonable. It's saying, okay, if you've given this spell, the length of it is gonna be the number of digits in that magic number, plus the length of the words you said, plus 11 for toil and trouble. So when we run it, Scala Check's gonna like try a bunch of different options, not just your sort of basic, let's throw some edge cases that we can think of at it. Scala Check being a computer is gonna be able to think of way more than I can. If it fails, and this is where we get kind of powerful, right? If it fails, it's gonna shrink the, the failure set to try to figure out why it failed. So right here, it was like trying some crazy stuff, right? It, had, it was like throwing Korean at it. It had some crazy small number that it was throwing at it. Once it got a failure, it said, whoa, 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 back up. Something's wrong with this code. I'm gonna try to shrink it. 
and it's going to try to figure out what the number should be. And the magic number has to be positive. Duh, it's a magic number, right? Uh, everybody knows that. <laughs> so we have these three principles going on here. We've got a generation of input. So we've generated a bunch of lists of strings, and we've generated a bunch of ints. It's running those things multiple times, and then shrinking the fire space. And I'm going to talk about all three of these things and show you some cool stuff that you can do with all three. So generating input, how do we do that? Well, we have things called generators. And you'll notice that I didn't import anything. I really didn't define anything except that code I was going to run in that last file. That's because with Scala Check, you get built in a whole bunch of generators. You don't have to define them yourself for basic stuff. Um, you get your sort of uh, your primitives there, right? Uh, you've got a throwable and a date. Those, the generators for those are biased towards edge cases, so it's going to try things like negative numbers, it's going to try things like the empty string, things that when you were, if you were writing the test by hand, you would try to throw at it. For things below there, for those, that, that um, second and third bullet point there, it can t generate those by itself if, the, um, if it has a generator for the parameter type. So if you've got an option of a less string, it can generate it for you automatically. If you've got an option of some user-defined type and it doesn't know how to generate that, it's not gonna be able to generate an option of it, but given that you have a generator for the parameter type, it can generate an option in either tuples of all kinds, even functions, which is pretty crazy. Uh, same thing with containers. It's pretty easy also if you have your own custom containers to get, get free-ish generators for this. Um, and then there's some helper methods, like if you're writing any kind of test, you're going to end up wanting something like this, like a positive number or an alphanumeric string. And what that means is we can fix that test I showed you earlier by just using some stuff that's already in the box. Be like, no, I, I really meant everybody. I, I was never going to send it a negative number. I meant only generate positive numbers to test this with. So that's pretty cool. Magic sum for you. Of course, you know. We often do things with data that's not just primitive types, so you tend to want to get a little bit fancy, right? So I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can make fancier gens, and it's actually surprisingly simple, surprisingly readable. So three of the big ones that we use are going to be choose, one of, and sum of. Um, and so here I'm going to walk through these. The first one, choose, just pick something in a range. And that happens a lot, especially for input that has some kind of real world meaning, like an age or you know, a number of months or something like that. You're not, you actually don't need to test it over the full integer space, so that lets you do it. Uh, the choose is going to pick something randomly from that range. If you want to bias towards the edge cases, there's another method you can use. One of and sum of, you specify actual values here, and one of will pick one, and some of will make a list of, it'll make many lists of different sizes of the things you specified. These are some little like spell testing methods. You know, you want to make sure that you're not casting magic with bugs in it, unless you're trying to make bugs appear, in which case you'd probably write a different test for that. Um, so that's, that's useful. What if we want to get a little more complicated? Uh, these last two, actually, this last one actually, uh, we've passed in actual values there, but you can use it as a higher order generator, which is kind of crazy. You can say, hey, I know how to generate like an ingredient. So I want to generate a list if I give you that generator. And it, it, the possibilities of what it can generate just like explode. It can make so many different things, which is awesome. So sum of is a high order gen. List of is a high order gen. Um, one thing that's cool about this is it shrinks things as well the same way that it would with just like a list of strings. So it'll say, well, we're probably going to want to try an empty list first, right? That's often going to be a thing that fails. And, if you use these sort of out-of-the-box ones to put your stuff together, you get the shrinks for free, too. It's one way to compose it. Um, if you want to mix stuff together, you have even more paths here. You can compose them using map, flat map, and filter, which is usually called such that for whatever reason. So I'm sure Scala folks are looking at that. You're like, those are the three magic words. Because when you have those three things, you can do four comprehensions, which is cool. Here's some examples. Basically, it means that you get to you get a lot of power out of modeling your data using these built-in gens, which is cool. Here we can make anything into a spell. We can make an arbitrary number of spells. If you want your witch name here, we can make arbitrary witch names. And I've used flat map here so that I can have access to two different generators in combination. If you see a flat map, then a map, what are you thinking? You're thinking of four comprehension, right? That's pretty readable, right? You're putting together an ingredient list. And you've, you've got now, if you like multiply this out, this means a computer is capable of generating like a gajillion random recipes. And so if you have some kind of code that operates on this, 
you don't have to specify what the inputs are for tests, which is really useful because you know, the limitations of your tests are always as far as the input, and this kind of really expands that out. One thing I want to point out, so such that you're going to use a lot, right? Like, if you're, if you're doing anything, you're going to have constrained values. Such that can be a little bit dangerous. Um, such that is, is another word for filter. So what it really does is if you say such that or choose or like anything like that, if you say such that it's an int that's less than 100, right? It's going to generate ints, and it's just, it doesn't do anything smart about it. It just makes a bunch, and it'll throw away anything that doesn't meet, meet the predicate, very much like filter on a list does, which is usually OK, but like if you're doing something really specific, you might want to get fancier with your gen, because you can run out of like tests to do. It'll take too long to discard all these things. Another thing that you can use retry until if you run into this, if you're like, ugh, it can't find any you know, names that begin with K. And you can do retry until it meets the predicate. But I would encourage you, if you're like making heavy use of choose or such that, to think about, especially if this is something that has any kind of user-facing input, think about whether you've got code constraints that, that keep that from happening. Because you, know, you say that age can only go up to 100, but then if you've got a witch using your code, witches live forever. That lady's 250. So she's going to break your code, and you won't even know it because your tests pass, which would suck. So that's just like a basic sort of, that's the set of builders. That's kind of it. That's all of them. You know, you guys know how to do this. This is how you build lists. This is how you compose lots of things in Scala. You can build really crazy arbitrary models of your data using this. And so this is a little snippet um, from Eric Torrebore, who writes Specs2, um, did a generator for arbitrary JSON, which as you, I'm sure you can imagine how that might be useful to test how your app responds to JSON, especially if you're parsing it. And you'll notice here, um, I'm not going to go into too, de too into depth into this, although I do encourage you to check it out because it's pretty elegant. Notice that a JSON type, it generates a JSON array or a JSON object. JSON object calls values. It's a list of other values. It's actually recursive because you know, Java's, uh, JSON maps can be like, infinitely nested. There is a, a stop to this. That's why there's a specified depth. But that's pretty useful, too. That's also like. The thing that gets me excited about this is if you've ever written a parser for anything, it's when stuff starts getting nested that my code starts breaking. I don't know about you guys. So being able to automatically generate lots of, of weird edge casey things about that is pretty cool. Other things you can do with gens, um, sometimes the like standard distribution of things is not necessarily what you're looking for. You don't want the random one. You don't want just the blonde brunette and the redhead. So you can specify frequency with like a huge amount of um, granularity. You can you basically provide a histogram. So you can say, I want half of my values to be even, and then I want the next third of them to be divisible by seven or whatever. And you can you can build that out pretty um, pretty specifically. And in fact, we ran into this in production. When someone filed a P1 bug, because in the app at the company I worked for, they searched for Beyonce and nothing came up. And I don't know about you guys, but that's like wake people out of bed bad uh, to me. So you might get, you might have already figured out why we were using alpha strings to test our stuff, right? Beyonce is properly spelled with an E with a, a apostrophe on it or an accent on it. Otherwise, it would be beyond, duh. Um, and so our, our code didn't handle it well, and so we would miss it in our test. So what did we end up doing? Well, it turns out we actually didn't want to test against every string. And if you do Scala check like, uh, uh, naively and you put string in there, you'll see, and this makes sense, it goes for like Korean first almost always, to the point that I've had it like slow down my machine for some reason. I don't know. My machine can't keep up. I don't know, do they not have? Max in Korea? I don't know. Um, but it'll spit out a ton of Korean, and then it'll go on to other sort of less common uh, strings, which is perfect. That's what you want this library to do, right? Because you wouldn't think of that yourself. Our, our app did not actually support Korean yet, you know? It uh, wasn't internationalized. So we kind of were like, well, we want to support some. Instead of hand coding like a list of like, OK, you can use E with an accent, and you can use an umlaut, because like Motley Crue, but like we're actually not ever going to use an upside down question mark. Instead of doing that, what we ended up doing is just using our production data. We had a bounded set of search terms, because um, we had a bounded set of things we had content on. So we just pulled them from production, and we loaded them into memory, and we actually used a histogram to represent how frequently they were searched for, and we got a pretty accurate um, 
coverage of our code. You also could just do it randomly. You could even, you could even, if you wanted to reverse the histogram and try to like cover the ones that don't get searched that often more often, it's pretty cool. Um, a coworker of mine took that idea a step farther and he actually built, took a corpus of all the English words used in all the content we had and a histogram of that and put that into Scholacek so he could generate English-y sounding documents, which were useful for testing machine learning stuff on. He used those for some Scholacek tests, but actually you have a method in Scholacek. Scholacek's a pretty small library, right? So it generates all these inputs. You can tell it how to generate a document using this frequency histogram that you've defined. And then you can pull samples from it. There's a method, it's literally called sample. It's dot sample and it gives you a, a, a piece of data that's defined by your generator. You can use that in anything. Um, he, was, he used it as like sort of a um, base function for some machine learning code he did. Uh, we've, I've also used it for performance testing. Uh, have you guys ever used Scalameter? It's a micro benchmarking framework that uses this DSL that's really pretty similar to Scholacek. So it was a useful thing to do to say, I already have generators for this. If I wanna see how fast a particular algorithm performs on it, I can just convert those pretty easily into a Scalameter generator. It's a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful because Scalameter on purpose runs over static values because otherwise your, your performance benchmarks aren't that useful. And so if you're biased too much towards, ed towards edge cases, it's not that that's not a useful performance number, it's just like a really specific performance number. But that's a, two examples of using Scholacek in a non-test way, just for the generators. So those are generators. Um, the, other, the second thing I said I was gonna cover is running the Scholacek tests. So there's a bunch of ways you can do it. One, Scholacek has its own runner, um, and own sort of a syntax for tests that's pretty simple. It's like basically assertion based. If you're already using a testing framework like Scholatest or Specs2, there's integration for that. You also can run it on the command line. Every property that you define has a built-in main method, which is pretty cool because you can integrate that into like custom build processes. There's a test callback. You can do all sorts of Rube Goldberg-y machine things with your Scholacek tests. Um, one cool example that I've seen recently is Jessica Kerr has an example using Scholatest Selenium integration with Scholacek integration. So she's basically controlling the browser with her mind. I, like you don't need actual monkeys at typewriters to make random input go into the browser, but it's kind of cool because Selenium lets you execute JavaScript from Scala. So you can like test your, you can property, you can use property, you can basically write property based tests of your JavaScript without writing any more JavaScript. And knowing Scala programmers, I think that's something you guys would be excited to hear about. Uh, yeah, so that's a way you can run it. When you write the test, they actually end up being fairly similar to how you write example based tests. Um, if you have sort of a feeling for how to write unit tests, you're gonna sort of, which, which involves often sort of gravitating towards edge cases, because that's where our code tends to break. You're gonna be good at writing Scala check tests. There is a little bit of a wrinkle in that um, you wanna write like a verification method that doesn't just duplicate the logic that you use in the actual code. Because otherwise like you're just testing, you know, sort of equality or your ability to remember how you wrote the original code. One like useful principle that I've um, read about is doing round trip properties. So if you have, uh, if you have methods that come in pairs that do opposing things to data, really common thing would be encoding and decoding. What you can do is do like a round trip test and say that the, if, you, if you apply the encoding and then the decoding, it equals the initial output, input. And that's really, um, that's kind of elegant because you get to test both. Like, oftentimes there'll be bugs in the princess kiss that weren't in the turn into frogs. So that's kind of cool. This is all covers basically, everything that I've covered so far is, is pretty functional, right? These are self-contained. You have to be really careful with side effects because it runs these tests over and over and over again. This is best suited for things that don't alter state. Scholarship has a, a set of traits that's designed for testing stateful systems. And I'm not gonna lie, I don't totally understand it. It's like kind of like mind explodey. Um, it's basically like you make this abstract state model and then you like define commands that operate on it. And then Scholacek will like create a sequence of commands, like random sequences of commands, and you've defined post conditions, and it checks that the post conditions always hold, and you can define paths that it can take and paths that it can't take. It's pretty cool. Um, I encourage you to check out this presentation by uh, Ricky Nielsen, who wrote the Scholacek library and maintains it. 
he's using NixOS and Scala check to generate VMs with like randomly generated properties like memory and OS version and IP address. And it like gens the configuration, the test spins them up, and then it uses these commands to see what happens when they ping each other in different. It's, it's like, whoa, whoa. It's, it's crazy town. It's honestly kind of edging into Skynet for me, and I can't read about it too much like right before bed. But definitely check that out. It's pretty cool. That's some things you can do with writing of the tests. So when you run them, there are certain properties where you can test like the total set of input. Those aren't very interesting usually, right? It's like an enum test or something. Most of the time, you're gonna be constrained by the fact that it takes time to run tests. Um, you have to have some bounds, and that's where params for running tests kinda come in. This is the ones that you can set up, and you can set these up in code, or you can often set them up in the runner, depends on how you're running them. Minimum successful tests uh, is, it doesn't just run it once, it runs, these, it runs these properties a bunch of times over a bunch of input. It defaults to 100. It's gonna test each property that you find at least that number of times, unless it finds a false case. And if it finds a false case, it's gonna stop generating new ones according to your generator rules, and then it's gonna go ahead and try to shrink them. If you increase this, you're gonna increase safety, right? You're gonna have more test coverage the more minimum successful tests you have, but it takes longer to run. So, you know, something you could do is on your Jenkins builds late at night, maybe increase the size more and run an hour long thing, but then when you're just doing build integration, run a shorter one, there's things you can do there. Max discarded has to do with that uh, filtering method, right? Sometimes you're, you've written code that has like pretty dis, like constrained inputs and It'll give up, it'll be like, I can't, I don't, what do you want from me? Nothing's passing. Uh, sometimes you have to increase this, although it's kind of a smell, like hopefully you can generate things in such a way that it's not just making things and discarding them, because that's a waste of time. And min size and max size, so when it's testing your code, it's gonna start with the, the generator, it's gonna give it a size. It's gonna start with like a, a, the minimum size and it's gonna increase it up to max size. Some generators don't care. If you're picking one of five things, it doesn't matter what size you give. But if you want a list, of things, and it's an arbitrarily sized list, it's gonna start small and build up. So that's pretty important, um, especially if you're storing stuff in memory, you can run into issues with this. Um, it makes the most sense for collections, and you can use this yourself with uh, the size param for gens. The last one is number of worker, thre worker threads. Like I said, you wanna be careful about side effects, because if it's not one, it will run them in parallel, and you, you may find race conditions which is good, <laughs> but um, you wanna be aware of what you're doing. So that's running, and then the very last thing is shrinking. And this, to me, again, is a little bit Skynetty. It's crazy to me. It knows the mistake I made before I did. It's pretty cool. When it finds a failure in your code, it stops genning, and it moves into shrinking. And it looks for a shrink instance for the gen types, which is gonna like shrink down that space to try. Like int, literally, if it finds a failure int, it's gonna literally make it like smaller, basically. With a tuple, it'll go for each one. It'll try to first shrink the first one, then the second one, then the third one. With a list, it'll just like remove chunks until it gets it to stop failing. Um, by default, if it doesn't have a shrink, and sh there's a bunch of shrinks provided, but if it can't find a shrink, and this is common if it's a user-defined class, it'll, it won't shrink at all. And it's still an immensely useful library, but you can define your own shrinks if you want to, especially if you're doing custom data, like uh, data structures. That's probably something that might be useful to you. Uh, this is actually just the actual shrink, default shrink implementation for int, but I witched it up a little bit. Um, as you can see, what it does is it takes a failure and it needs to return a stream. So it's gonna go in and it's gonna take the failing one and like go down by halves all the way down and then it's gonna interleave positive and negative to try to shrink to be like, which ints are really failing? So that's pretty cool. Okay. That was a whirlwind tour of cool stuff in Scala Check. Now I'm going to attempt to turn it over to my dear colleague, Stu, who is not actually here, as you may have noticed. He's not a ghost. He's uh, driving through North Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> One of those states um, on, you know, urgent family business. But he has uh, done us the good deed of recording a pretty cool little tour of how all this stuff fits together.
This isn't technically live coding since he recorded it, but knowing Stu, unless there's like video editing software in Emacs, he basically recorded it all in one go. So this is as close to live coding as you're gonna get. And I'm gonna try right now to play it with his voice, but we don't have audio input, so I'm gonna try it with a microphone. And if that doesn't work, I'm gonna put my headphones on and we'll like UN it, do simultaneous translation. But let's see if we can get Stu's voice up on the thing. Let's go I'll check in a small project. If you look at the build SBT I'm going to start with, it does nothing but import the Scala check library. We're going to create a single test. We're going to call it up down Scala, and it's going to be a Scala check test. Uh, it's going to have a single spec called up down, and it's going to test a single property, which is that up then down is the same as down. It's going to take a string as input and it's going to do just that. It's going to take the string, convert it to uppercase, then to lowercase, and see if that's the same as taking the same string and just converting it to lowercase. Uh, let's go to a shell and try to run our test. You might expect that this test would pass, but actually it will fail uh, often. And the reason it fails is that there are many Unicode characters where two different lowercase characters share the same uppercase character. Um, so uh, the interesting thing in the output here I wanted to point out is that we get two different values back when we get a failed test here. We get arg0 original, which is the original test case that failed. And then what it's done is given us an arg0, which is just a single character, which causes the problem for us. It does that by taking our original string and shrinking it into smaller and smaller pieces until it's narrowed it down to a single failing character. Uh, let's play around in the console and see how this works. If I import org.scala check, um, I can play with things in implicit code scope called shrink instances. There are shrink instances for lots of different values. If you look at the string instance, we can ask it to shrink a string for us. Take ASDF. Uh, when I run shrink, it's going to give me back a stream. If I force the stream, we can see all the things on the stream. And starting from my ASDF original string, what it's done is it's given me uh, some smaller versions of that same string to try as possible new test cases. If we were to take one of these, uh, if one of those were to fail, it would give me back even smaller and smaller cases until I get an empty string which when I ask it to shrink the empty string, it's going to tell me, uh, it's going to give me back an empty stream saying I can't shrink that any further. And there are these shrink instances for lots of different types. I can shrink, you know, ints for instance, uh, and I can even shrink tuples of string and int. Uh, if I give it a, a tuple of a string and an int, it will give me a stream of possible new values where it first tries to shrink the string and then it tries to shrink the int. So let's go back to our test case. Um, here uh, is not the most interesting thing to be testing. What's much more interesting to be tasting is if we had uh, people, because per people are more interesting than strings. We're going to say that people have names and they have ages. Um, and so we're going to change our test case to, instead of taking strings, to take people. Uh, and now we're going to try and string their names. I don't mean shrink, I mean convert them from uppercase to lowercase. If I were to try to run my test case here, it's going to fail on me, uh, saying that it doesn't know how to create arbitrary people yet. Uh, so that's something we know how to do. Uh, we can put in implicit scope um, a arbitrary person and we can create that using a for comprehension. People will have arbitrary names and they'll have arbitrary ages and that is how you make people. And now I expect that when I try and run my test case again, it will know how to uh, create arbitrary people and therefore create arbitrary test cases. 
and I'll find failing test cases. However, in this case, it no longer is giving us back a, a shrunk version of their name. Uh, I get this long string, and it's going to be tough for me to figure out uh, why this big string failed. And that's because uh, it does not know how to shrink people, because that's something I just made up. So we can fix that by uh, telling it how to shrink people by creating an implicit uh, person shrinker. We're just going to be of type shrink person. Now I'm going to use a constructor they give us uh, that takes a person as input and returns that stream of shrunken people. Um, but that's not going to be uh, too easy to create but on my own. But knowing that I have a way of shrinking tuples, um, we should be able to shrink people if we know how to shrink tuples of string and int. Uh, now how would we do that? So first we'll ask it to shrink a person, but it can't shrink a person. It knows how to shrink a tuple, but I can take a trade a tuple it knows how to shrink out of this uh, by tupling the person by name and by age. Now this is going to give me back a stream of tuples, but I need a stream of people. So I can map the stream and we can use the person apply method that comes with our case classes as long as I tuple it as well. So now I expect that when I uh, try to run my test case again, I will get failing tests and now the name is shrunk for me again. Um, so this is great. Uh, now I have much easier failing test cases to work with. Uh, however, this is not fun to write. Uh, this is um, something that's a little bit tedious, and it might be tedious to remember how exactly we did it. Um, and so you'd hope that maybe there's some magic to make this um, happen automatically. And as it turns out, there is. And whenever you're talking about magic that involves case classes and tuples, some of you may guess where we're going to go with this. And that magic often comes from the shapeless library. Uh, in this case, we're going to use uh, Shapeless Scala Check, which is part of the Shapeless Contrib project. Um, and it provides exactly the magic we're looking for in this case. Um, so all I'm going to have to do here is import shapeless.contrib.scala check. And now, um, if we reload our project and make sure that it still does compile, uh, what I'll be able to find is that now I don't need to create these shrink instances. And in fact, Shapeless will know how to just put them into explicit scope for me. And in fact, I can get rid of the uh, arbitrary instance I had to create. Shapeless will know how to create that for me as well. And we'll test and it creates arbitrary people which are arbitrarily shrunk. shrunk. Um, so that's great. And if uh, however, it's not always going to be the case that you can use the arbitrary stuff that ScalaCheck creates for you. You might have to create it yourself. Uh, for instance, uh, we might say that people have birthdays. And a birthday is going to take a person and return a new person. And that's going to be by making a copy where the age uh, is increased by one. So we might uh, test something like this and say that uh, birthdays make you older uh, and we'll say that person after they've had a birthday their age is greater than the person we started with and if we run this uh, we'll find that uh, we actually get a failing test case because someone whose age is max int when we increase it we actually get min int and that's not greater than max int. So our test case is failing. However, um, this is really because this is a bad uh, way of generating arbitrary ages for people. And th the point is, is that if we were to use the, this, that's the same code that we're going to get from the shapeless library, which will also fail. So in cases like these, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to create the generators of myself, which create more reasonable people um, and reasonable people um, only live to be 300 years old.
and now my test case will fail. So the magic is nice uh, when you can use it. You won't be you'll always be able to use it for a lot, but for a lot of the cases that you're going to generate, you'll find that um, Scala Check is able to do a lot of the stuff for you, which makes uh, writing these tests a lot more pleasant uh, and a lot easier. Yeah. So that's a little bit of, a, of magic. Um, oh, wow, I'm back in the real world now. Um, that was hard. I don't know how they do it at the UN. That was just English to English, too. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wind it up. Uh, we have to, a little bit of time for questions, but besides questions, because this is usually what they are anyway, if anyone who is doing Scholar Check is doing something cool with it and would like to share, that would be awesome. I would love to hear about it. So yeah.